um, and just am excited to hear her full story. Um, when we first met, they were in a tricky situation living with, um, I'm sure she'll talk about this, but had a house, um, big house issue, and we're actually living, um, how many years did, did you have to live a year? We had True. some friends that opened their basement up to our crazy yeah. family for two years. And so I could not probably, I'm not sure if you can handle that, but she did gracefully. And um, she is definitely, I would say, graceful and full of grace and humble. And so I'm excited to welcome Grace. And your last name, I feel like I always mess up. Jabber. Jabber, okay, okay. So come on up, Grace. Okay. Um, I don't have any credentials or certifications, so some of you may have even way more experience than I have. So my story, or what I'm going to talk to you today, is just the experiences I've learned along the way and where God has put me and what he's opened my eyes and ears up to, um, and just honestly what he's allowed me to sit in and feel with my kids. So. Public speaking is not my thing. I'm so much better at writing and just, here, read what I wrote. <laughs> so I apologize now that I will probably fumble through this. Um, but here we go. There are, as we all know, so many beautiful sides of adoption and foster care. There's the story of God's fingerprints as the family walks the journey. Um, there's the story of an orphan leaving the orphanage. There's the story of a teenager finding a forever home. There's a story of siblings all being kept together. There's the picture of a multi-race family. There's the story of a couple struggling with infertility, filling their arms with a child. There is so much beauty in this redemptive story. But adoption and foster care also have an ugly side. It's grief and loss and pain and trauma. It's all written there inside that beautiful story. I always call it the beautiful ugly because there is this amazingly beautiful piece that comes with this really ugly piece. I know I'm not telling you guys anything new here. You guys are all experienced. You've faced everything I'm going to talk about. Um, <clears throat> but adoption and foster care means a loss of a child's first family. He or she has lost both parents, siblings, grandparents, relatives, and friends. Let that sink in for a minute. The child has lost everyone. And not only is this child living with loss, he or she also carries the memories that put them into foster care or adoption. All that baggage and trauma is permanently imprinted into his or her little brain. This happens even if the child is adopted straight after birth. <clears throat> Imprints are left from pregnancy. And the loss and trauma can be evident from the very beginning. Or it can stay hidden for years only to surface when you least expect it. This is the ugly side of adoption and foster care. The side that can wreak havoc, the side that can throw families off balance. The side we try to cover up, the side we have a hard time letting our friends and family see, maybe even the side we have a hard time admitting is there. But I've learned that the more we try to pretend it doesn't exist, the more it rears its ugly head. This doesn't help our children or our families, in order to help them grow and become as whole as possible, we have to acknowledge this side and we have to be their safe place. We have to allow them to grieve and process, which in turn allows them to heal. It isn't easy, we will all fail, but we have to keep pressing on and allow God to work in and through us with these kids. So for a minute, just imagine what these children feel. Imagine losing everyone important to you. Imagine feeling all of that pain and loss. And then imagine not knowing who to share that information with. Imagine wondering if it's okay to ask questions, okay to be sad, or okay to be angry. Imagine looking around at your family and seeing faces you don't look like. Until we get on this level and really feel our children's pain, we can't help them heal. Like I mentioned, I don't come with any credentials other than being a permanent mom of five, a mom to one bonus child for now, and a temporary mom to count with other children throughout the years. I come with a lot of failures and a lot of success. I come with, honestly, that at times I throw my hands up in defeat. At times I feel like I'm exactly the wrong mom for my children. I come with fear of how to do what God has called me to do. 
I also come with a lot of joys and the privilege of taking care of children I didn't birth. The joy of seeing children blossom and grow. The joy of seeing our family put together in such a unique and intricate way. But I am going to speak to you today as a mom that is currently in the trenches, as I know some of you are. Our three girls were all adopted, one from an agency and two from foster care. One of our sons is a previous foster care child who has chosen to come back and live with us. Trauma looks different in each of the children in our home. We have a lot of emotions in our home on a daily basis, and with age, I feel like that emotion changes shape and size. So I never know what to prepare for. <laughs> I'm sure you guys understand that. Our family life can be difficult. Some days start out stressful, some days end stressful, some days it's both. I'll be completely honest with you, over the last couple of years, our family life has really taken a hit. I have felt many times that we've failed or done the wrong thing, which I'm sure you guys can relate to as well at times. There are times I throw my hands up in defeat, but you know, God doesn't call us to easy lives. When we answer his call, sometimes, probably more all the time, <laughs> we have a hard road ahead of us. I love the verses in 2 Corinthians 1, 8, and 9, which read, For we do not want you to be uninformed, brothers and sisters, about the troubles we experienced in the province of Asia. We were under great pressure, far beyond our ability to endure, so that we despaired of life itself. Indeed, we felt we had received the sentence of death. But this happened that we might not rely on ourselves, but on God, who raises the dead. I love reading that even the disciples were under such pressure that was far beyond their ability, and they felt like, I think I'd rather be dead right now. <laughs> I love hearing that the disciples who walked with Jesus, see, like right there, they still experience that pain, <clears throat> that hardship, and I feel that some days. But like they said, we serve a God who raises the dead. So he can surely handle our problems if we just remember to rely on him as the disciples did. You've probably never heard of grog unless you work with pottery. I hadn't heard of it until I read a book by Lisa Turkhurst. I'm not an expert, so I'm probably not going to get this 100% correct. So if you want to go home and do your own research, that's fine. <laughs> grog is clay which has been fired and ground up into a fine powder. This powder is then added into a new clay. Grog adds a strength to the new clay and also eliminates some of the shrinkage when the pottery is fired. Grog often comes from broken pots. Rather than throwing away the broken pieces, they are ground up to add strength to a new beautiful piece of pottery. As you mix the clay, you can feel it. In fact, if you aren't careful, it can be quite abrasive on your hands. The finished product may have tiny visual differences that you as the potter notice, but the majority of us wouldn't know there was grog added in. This reminds me of our job raising children that come from broken paths. These kids have been broken into pieces and then brought into our home. We could simply try to glue the pieces back together, but we all know that would create a weak version of what was there. Or we could help these kids grind up the broken pieces and form a new, stronger version of themselves. This isn't an easy job, as we all know. It's abrasive. It might have caused some cuts and bruises along the way. And honestly, we may not even see the fruits of our labor. But our kids need us to help them form grog from their brokenness. Our kids need us to help them to become strong and beautiful. What this looks like in our house is messy. Before I jump right into that, I want you to know that we have seen God move mountains in our lives. My kids are incredibly resilient and strong. There are so many stories I could share that show just the incredible ways that God has worked, how he's brought kids into our lives. The beautiful side. There's a lot of those. But there are also messy parts, really messy. That's where my focus is going to be today, on the raw and difficult side of our family, because too often, I don't think we talk about this side, but we all face it in different ways, but it's not something that we share very often. <clears throat> we are blessed to have three very emotional girls. <laughs> I say that in all sincerity. They let us see what they feel, and I'm thankful for that. <laughs> but seeing what they feel, getting to experience their huge emotions, is also really hard. <laughs> um, some of you may have kids like that, where their emotions are huge, and you can read them just like you read a book. You know what they're feeling. Um, or you may have kids like our previous foster son who's living with us, but you have to play hide and seek with his emotions. Um, 
You know, there's others that will completely shut down, and there are some who may never show any signs of grief or trauma the entire time they're living with you. However, you have to be ready to show up and be that safe place no matter when or how those emotions come about. I began to realize just how much grief was present when our now 13-year-old was two, which I know sounds really crazy, but she has always been like what you would call an old soul. She has understood way deeper things than children her age normally do. She is wise beyond her years, starting at that really young age. Um, she came into our lives straight from the hospital at six weeks old. I didn't understand then that she had experienced grief and pain and trauma, but her brain has, and most of you I'm sure already know that, but there's so much research out there of what they experienced from in the womb, day one, everything. So at two, she wanted to know who she looked like. We've always talked about adoption. She knew she was adopted. We don't have the same color of skin, it's obvious. Um, and she did, she wanted to know who she looked like. And I wasn't prepared for that at the age of two. Hadn't crossed my mind that she would want to know. So we contacted the agency to see if they could help us out. And at that time, they didn't have any contact with the birth mom. Had no, they tried, couldn't find her. Um, so I was able to find a painting <clears throat> and it was this beautiful painting of a black woman and a white woman. And then there was this little toddler, this beautiful black little toddler, looked exactly like my daughter, had the same little goofy little pigtails, and um, they were all holding a ribbon, and the ribbon was all braided into one. And that worked for her at the age of two. She could see herself in this little girl, she could see me, she could see another woman that she looked like, and that worked for her. Um, <clears throat> But at that age, I really did begin to see some things change. And there were a lot more emotions, a lot more anger became present, not necessarily that we could pinpoint what was going on, just her emotions got bigger at that age. Things started getting harder. And at four and a half, those questions came back. The anger became really present. And for lack of better words, she kind of lost her mind one day and she was in a sobbing fit, wanting to know why her mom couldn't keep her and why she couldn't afford her. I was definitely not expecting to have a conversation like that at that age. <laughs> um, those emotions seemed too big for her to have when she was so little. And I'm not going to lie, facing that was hard. Realizing my daughter was connected to a woman also called mom was hard on my heart. I remember wondering why I wasn't enough. Um, but I realized that's not the truth. The truth is my daughter needed to feel everything involving her birth mom and I needed to be that safe place for her. We contacted the agency again and with a little work this time they were able to get in contact with birth mom. So we got email and we were able to communicate back and forth and she was able to send a couple pictures over, real pictures. And those pictures have been framed in her room ever since. She's talked about her mom often. Sometimes it's questions, sometimes it's love, and sometimes it's anger. There are times I find the frame pictures turned around backwards in her room. I've made it a point to let her know that all of those emotions are okay. It's okay to feel all of it. And sometimes that means I take the brunt of her emotions. I'm the only physical version of a mom she has, so she gets angry at me. She fights me, she lashes out. It's not easy and it takes a toll. She takes it out on her siblings too. There is a lot of anger and pain Middle school has been really rough. I'm sorry. In all honesty, there are times that I have felt like she needs something more than I can provide. And I'm, I don't know, maybe some of you guys have felt that. If you haven't, you probably will at some point on this journey. Um, her grief and anger wiggles its way into who I believe I am and I start questioning my abilities. But again, I've had a choice to help her face it or give up. We found a new counselor to start EMDR, which has not been an easy process, but I know it's good. We also made a decision to meet her biological family, which I know isn't something that can always happen. Unfortunately, mom wouldn't meet, but she was able to meet her big sister, and I was surprised at how much joy this brought me as her mom watching this happen. Um, watching these two sisters meet was pretty incredible. Her older sister was 14 when our daughter was born. So her older sister had a lot of pain and grief.
treat as well. So watching them meet was really incredible. They look a lot alike. I mean, you can tell they are sisters. <laughs> um, my daughter now has this older sister that she can text, she can FaceTime, she can communicate with. So it's worked out. It doesn't always work out that well to have connections with biological families, but it did, and I'm really blessed that it did. But it didn't fix the hole inside of her. She still has this hole where her birth parents fit. So this will continue to be a process for her. It will continue to be one of the most difficult things that her family walks through. Her grief is anger, and anger is hard. But I have to help her grind up all these pieces of her past and add it back into the beautiful new creation that God is working on. Our other two daughters face their pain and grief differently. My nine-year-old cries a lot over her birth mom. A lot. And that probably started when she was about six. To her, the story is painfully sad and unfair. There is no anger, just sadness. Really, really deep. She wants to know her mom. She wants to be friends with her mom. We have found pictures of her and made sure she has those pictures up on her wall too. We make sure she knows it's safe to talk about her mom, pray for her mom. Sometimes that means we write her mom letters. They don't get mailed, but we put them in a little file. It's more like a journal for my daughter to feel like she's telling her mom things. And it helps. <clears throat> but sometimes this means that a random trigger sets her off and she gets all caught up in her emotions her body can't handle it. I have to take her and hold her while she's flailing around until she stops. And then the tears start. I hold her while she asks lots of questions for the same questions over and over again. We both cry. It's so hard to watch her feel pain that I have never felt as a grown-up. Pain that is too big for her little body to hold. All I can do is sit in that pain with her and that's okay. She needs to know it's safe. It does mean that sometimes when I'm tired and ready for bed, I have to hold her for an hour and walk her through whatever pieces of her story she wants to walk through. It's hard, it's tiring, but it's worth it. Our youngest daughter is seven. She's also totally different. She's actually pretty indifferent to her story. She talks about it and knows, but there aren't emotions tied to it. Her therapist says she has a really big grasp on how God has been in her story since the beginning and is taking care of her along the way. She's okay with it, and that's all she needs. However, her grief and pain does come out in her behaviors, even though she doesn't recognize it. One of her biggest manifestations of her trauma is her reaction to physical pain. Little things like stubbing your toe and scraping your knee. Um, Sorry, I lost the point. <clears throat> to her, sends her off on, I don't even know how you explain it, just this anger. She runs off in anger as if something was done to her purposefully, and she secludes herself with that. Um, she doesn't seek her comfort. She hasn't, I mean, as a little tiny toddler, she didn't. Um, I remember holding her when she got her, and she was just hidden. I mean, she was little, and it hurt me, but... She didn't know what to do with this physical pain. And um, so yeah, it's been a really slow process getting her to realize that we are who you run to for help. And as a mom, and you guys can understand this, you wanna hold your children and comfort them and make them better. And that's been a hard piece for me to have to work through is that she has to learn this. It's not coming natural to her because of the trauma that she's been through. But we're getting there. She's gotten a lot better and she's, she talks through it with us. She's also very volatile and has pretty impulsive behaviors when she's upset. So she'll throw things and break things and yell things. She does have immediate remorse and will talk through her feelings with us. <clears throat> it's interesting because she never talks about her birth mom in these moments, never, never comes up. But it's always about feeling unloved and how she's not good enough. That's hard too as a mother because <laughs> I want our love to be enough. And it's hard to be hit, it's hard to be screamed at, it's hard not to take it personally. But again, I have to give her that space, I have to help her walk through all those emotions that she carries, and I have to take it to the Lord and allow Him to walk me through the process. We're making progress, but it's a process. 
It's been an exhausting journey that God is walking us through. Exhausting at times. But it's also incredible to watch my girls grow and develop with the help of God in their lives. They are super emotional on a really positive level too. I mean, we get a lot of giggles and shrieks and songs and dances in our house. I love seeing them step out and try new things. As my oldest daughter has gotten older, it's been really neat to see her sensitivity to the Lord and watch her begin to use some of the gifts that he's given her. It's incredible to me what God can do in the midst of our pain and grief. He doesn't wait for us to overcome our trauma. He begins using us in the midst. In the midst of our troubles, he's there to use us, to grow us, and work with us. I'm seeing evidence of that in our girls' lives. I'm seeing beautiful pots start forming. So these pictures up here, that's what I'm talking about. All these broken pots. We have all these broken pieces. And we can do one of two things. We can take the easy route and we can glue them back together. But we all know looking at that pot, <laughs> it's not going to stand much. The water can leak out, it's going to crumble. Or we can do the hard work of really pushing it back in and working it into their lives. And then we can watch God <coughs> a beautiful new piece of pottery. <clears throat> David Goggins said, it's only in engaging and going deep in our suffering that we are able to, to grow and become stronger. So my hope in sharing our story, and this is just a little bit of our story, right? I mean, it's a daily thing, and it changes every year what we face. But I'm hoping that you guys realize you're not alone. Um, I've briefly touched on some of what our family experiences have been, and some of you have things you're like, yep, I can relate to that. Some of you can probably go way farther and deeper into stuff than we've never faced. <clears throat> but I want to leave you with some thoughts to ponder and some things, hopefully, that to encourage us all forward. So the first thing is, sometimes broken things create more brokenness. So the once harmless pot that's now broken into a bunch of pieces can now break somebody else. You can step on it sharp edge. So <clears throat> as a mom, I realized that walking my girls through all of their trauma causes trauma to myself and my other kids and my marriage. That's something I didn't realize would happen. It's painful and it's hard. And I don't know that I've done a good enough job with any of it, but I've realized that I now have to allow God to be worked in all of these pieces of my life as well. It's not easy. It's time consuming. Sometimes it feels like it's just too much, like you just want to say enough. <laughs> but in those moments, I have to recognize it's all part of the healing, all part of the remolding into something stronger and better. It's worth it in the end. So I encourage you to take a good look at yourself, your other kids, your marriage, and focus on those too. Because secondary trauma is real, <laughs> and it can feel a bit like you're drowning when you look at all the pieces that you need to work on. But don't give up. Find help, find solutions. Um, number two, one thing I've learned in my life, not just because of this topic, but also because of some really hard years in our life, I'll just hit on that for a little bit, <clears throat> is that God will meet us anywhere. And it is okay to scream and yell and argue with him. It's okay to tell him that you don't agree with him and his plan. He is big enough to handle it. You know, Jesus was human. He was fully human. And when I truly realized that God created him to be fully human, I realized that meant he feels all of our emotions that we feel. He gets it. He knows what we're feeling. I mean, if you look in the Bible and you, Jesus even asked God on the Mount of Olives to take the cup, cup of suffering away from him. Looking at what was coming was hard, painful, and ugly. He felt it. However, I was reminded recently by Again, Lisa Turkhurst, that the words following his question are important. Jesus says, nevertheless, not my will, but yours be done. God will meet us in our emotion and our pain. He will meet us on the bathroom floor as we cry. He will meet us curled up in our bed behind a locked door. He will meet us in our car as we're screaming out our emotions. I may have done some of these things. But we can't stay in that place. I'm thankful that he will meet me there, but he doesn't want to leave me there. 
we then have to say, not my will, but yours. And that's hard to do. I'm still trying to perfect that. I still want to tell God it's too hard and he should change the plan. <clears throat> Recognizing that Jesus feels my pain and emotions helps me get to that place of surrender, though. Psalm 91, 15 says, When he calls to me, I will answer him. I will be with him in trouble. Isaiah 43, 2 says, When you pass through the waters, I will be with you. And when you pass through the rivers, they will not sweep over you. He is a good, good father because he is with us through all that we face. He walks with us, holds us, listens to us through the struggle. And he will do that with us through our unique parenting journey as well. Three, be available. Talk about your kids' birth parents and family. Show them pictures. Allow them to ask questions and express emotions. Let them know that you are okay with it, that you love their birth family. <clears throat> Talk with a counselor on when and how you share the hard truths of their past, but be ready to do that. Be their safe place so they aren't trying to handle this enormous grief on their own. Even if they are angry or sad, they should be able to talk about their family because it's a part of who they are. If they're not ready to talk about it, that's okay too. Just make sure they know that you are okay and that you want that to be a part of their story. Number four, we need to give ourselves grace. This one's really hard for me actually. We will mess up, we will question our abilities and that's okay. But we need to recognize those times as a place of vulnerability and a place where Satan would love to step in and take control. <laughs> Negative thoughts will only destroy us. We have to take every thought captive and go back to what is true. We were made for this. We're right where God wants us. We can do this with his help. Five, we can't walk this journey alone. I have to be real and honest and invite people into this space. Like anything, we can't prepare 100% for what our children will need. We have no idea exactly where their grief will take them. We do, however, need to plan for help. We need friends we can call and vent with. We need friends who know will listen without judgment. We need friends who will encourage us and also hold us accountable. That starts with us being real, real with ourselves and with those around us. <clears throat> it's scary to admit you need help. I know there's times I've thought to myself, I signed up for this. Why, uh, why should I admit that I need help? I've also been you know, in that position where I don't want people to think I've failed. I don't want to look like I'm failing at my job. How do I invite people into a space you know, where I look like I'm failing. <laughs> it's hard to do that. And I've also been burned by friends that I thought would understand and I thought would listen to me and it's completely burned me. And, and that's hard. It's hard to be in that position and then want to reach out to somebody new. But my advice is to try. Try to open up and find someone. It's going to take prayer and effort. <clears throat> and you might not get it right the first couple of times. It may even be who you least expect. But don't give up. Keep trying to find your people. I'm so thankful for a couple friends that God has placed in this space in my life. They hear everything, but they know my heart. They know I need time to vent or cry. They know I need help sometimes. And they also love my children in ways that I never expected they would. Six, we also have to let go of our expectations. This has been really hard for me too. It's something I've realized I have to do on a regular basis. I've caught myself fighting this. Expectations take hold and I get frustrated. I can't remember who spoke this truth into my life, but years ago, someone did jump in and tell me that I needed to adjust my expectations. At first, it frustrated me. My expectations were fine. <laughs> but you know what? They were right. My expectations were inhibiting my parenting. I was also missing out on what God was trying to do in and through me. My family is not going to look like what I pictured, but it's going to look like what God pictured. Sometimes that will be hard, but sometimes it will be beautiful and better than I imagined. I don't want to miss out on what God has for me just because I'm stubborn. <laughs> I want to end with a little piece from a book called Born Broken, It's an Adoptive Journey by Kristen Berry. It's a beautifully raw story of one family's journey. If you haven't read it, it's really well done. Um, I like it because it's not there to tell us how to do anything. It's just sharing her story and being real. 
This is how she ends her book, and I love the picture of hope that it represents. <clears throat> My son is tethered to his past. He is chained to his hurt. He was born into a brokenness that he did not design or deserve. I see something in him, though, just beneath the rough surface. I see the light of something that has always been there, hope. The hope that one day my son will embrace the father who created him. The hope that my son's story will not end there. It is through my son's brokenness that I have seen my own fractured spirit magnified. For many years, I have grieved the loss of what I expected my son to be. I live in a culture that teaches us that if we believe in ourselves, anything is possible. When I was growing up, I was told that I could be anything I put my mind to. I have believed wholeheartedly that with hard work, perseverance, and a positive attitude, anything can be accomplished. I now believe something else as well. My son has taught me that we all fall short. He has taught me that despite my best intentions, I will never love deeply enough. I will never muster enough joy. My restless spirit will never allow complete peace. I can't always be patient. I am not always kind. I'm not quite as good as I wish. Even my faith is fickle. I desire to be gentle, but my edges are rough. My self-control only lasts for so long. Yes, we are strong and mighty, but in our humanity, we also have a frailty. It is in our limitations that we recognize our need for a God who is our strength. It is in our faults that we acknowledge our need for a Savior who redeems us. My own need to heal is amplified when I look in the eyes of my son. For now, I too am letting go. I will not hold on to the past. I will not hold on to what I hoped would be. I will allow myself to let go so that I may also become a part of my father's brilliant artistry. I will let go so that the rest of my son's story may be written by the God who created him. Thank you for listening. Hopefully something, something resonated. share when they you took away and um, some Grace's story. I have to say I'm not big into keeping prophecy into somebody's life, but there's a book here. <laughs> there's a book um, down in your soul, Grace, I feel like. I feel like there is definitely um, there's definitely a book there for sure. And um, my brother's adopted and um, it is he was adopted three days He was in the middle, um, so there was there were kids that were kept that were, were older than him, and then there were kids that were kept that were younger than him, and that's always been really hard for me to yeah. understand. Um, and so I just appreciate everything you shared. It's just I want one thing I, I wanted to ask from your standpoint, from a parenting standpoint, what do you think is the difference between uh, when you look at the picture up there? helping a child to just glue the pieces back together versus what, what steps do you feel like you guys are doing that's the difference between the two pictures on the left and the right? It's probably going to look different in every kid. Mm -hmm. um, but to me, <clears throat> I think it's mostly us being willing to let our kids feel everything. Mm -hmm. And I think that's something our culture is pretty bad at. <laughs> just you know you're fine put a band-aid on go back to life and I don't think we can do that with our kids there are things we can be tough and just put a band-aid on and go back but when it comes to the trauma the grief the loss that they've experienced it, I just think we have to be willing to walk them through it we have to allow them to feel whatever that looks like I mean we've had our daughter she moved out for a week um, as a 12 year old with a good friend of mine because she was in such a space of so much anger she didn't want to do anything with our family anymore she hated everyone and we had to be okay with okay so go home with her and we'll work through this mm -hmm. and as a parent you feel like well i clearly suck as a parent <laughs> i just let my 12 year old pack up and move out but that's the kind of stuff we have to be okay with. The stuff that the rest of the world is gonna look at you. I mean, if everybody knew what was going on, I mean, you'd get judged from all sides. But what was really going on is I was letting my daughter feel everything she needed to feel. And that meant she needed the freedom to say, 
I hate everything about my life. I want to walk away from it for a minute. And she did. And she came back and we worked through it and we found new therapy and, you know, and so I think it's going to look different with every kid, but I think you have to just be okay with following their lead mm -hmm. and letting them say what they need to say and ask what they need to ask. My next question. Oh, oh I'm sorry. Oh, go ahead. No, mm -hmm. just have you found a good therapist that you really feel like has been good with your girls? Um, I am really excited about EMDR, and I don't even remember what it stands for. It's eye movement, <laughs> something else. But it's a bilateral stimulation that they do while they're talking with your kids. And it's somehow how it works. Look it up. <clears throat> it really works with trauma. It helps rewire some of where you have these breaks because of the trauma you've experienced. And they do it in different ways. There's a lot of people that won't even do it on children just because you have to basically be trained a different way to do it. So my younger girls are going and seeing a therapist in Iola. So we drive an hour to Iola, um, and she does a type of EMDR, but it's more wrapped into the play therapy she does, um, because you can't do it the same, right, when they're younger. And then our 13-year-old goes to Rafa House in Joplin, and she is doing um, EMDR with a young gal that is fairly new there. And that's actually worked really well for her because we've done, I mean, you guys all know this, you find a counselor you think's great, and they might very well be great, but if your kid doesn't, <laughs> doesn't click, then it's not going to do anything. And so we've, we've had different counselors in and out, um, but I think we're in a good spot with both of them. Um, so, and we're all, last question, we're all three adopted new babies. Um, so our oldest was six weeks old when we picked her up. Um, Abby came to us when she was nine weeks old, and then you know she was in foster care until we adopted her, but she was with us from nine weeks on. And then Libby was two weeks old when we found out about her, but because she was in a different state, all that paperwork, <laughs> it took five months to get her here. And that was five months with us pushing and pushing foster family there doing the say, same that's thing. pretty quick it is <laughs> and that was us flying out when it was like okay it's good but you're gonna have to wait for the tickets and we're like nope we're on the plane <laughs> we'll take care of it um so they were all libby i think was probably the hardest as far as attachment which is i think what we're seeing with some of hers is because she was fully attached to her foster family there she was five months old she was she loved them they were they're good people she's maintained that attachment we do have a relationship with them but so that was a much harder break because she was at that five, six month age where they really would want to bond. But. Yeah, I was going to supplement what you said about the difference between the two. I think, you know, the repair picture is that parenting style that says everything has to be okay, right? We have to put on this good face. We have to be, we have to be the perfect family. We, we can't let this stuff, you know, affect us on the outside. And then the picture of the grog is more like, yeah, this, this is just who we are. <laughs> Sorry. Um, and, and working through that and accepting that brokenness instead of, you know, trying to put the pieces back together um, because it's, it's, a, it's a deeper process. Um, it gets messy, like Grace said. And, right. Um, it's, a, it's a really good analogy of what happens. Part of the heart of breakdown process. Mm -hmm. you first get them, it takes a while to get them broke down into the pieces right. that you can put back together. Right. Yeah. We got like our own children, they look back at when they were younger and lived with us and, and they thank God for the foster care process that they went through because it gave them the life skills they probably wouldn't have had otherwise. They're 30 and going to be 30, 31 and going to be 30 this year. So they now have, well, obviously the 10 grandkids. Um, so, so they now see that. And, and my son married a foster, not a, one of our foster children, but she was a foster child in someone else's home. And he recognizes all the brokenness pieces mm -hmm. In her and respects those and uh, and just mm -hmm. continues to build with 
mean, they, they have a beautiful family. How this girl, uh, she's working to be a teacher. She's not even, she's 25. Four kids just had their last baby that's six months old. I, I just, kindergarten through, I, <laughs> yeah, they are, yeah. but but they have, they they are resilient and rely on um, family support, both biological, her biological, and they don't rely on the biological because it's iffy. But they have previous, her previous foster family, right. very supportive and very, yeah, it's just good. And I, I've sat and listened to a lot of adoptive panels, uh, adoptee panels, and they've talked about, I mean, all of them are so different, you know, and some have said, I've had zero interest in finding my birth family, zero interest in knowing anything about them. They don't, they don't need that piece. But they still struggle with their identity piece. You know, that's still a part of them, even though they don't want to meet them, have anything to do with them. There's still this grief and this pain of figuring out who I am, you know, who where do I? I get, <clears throat> where do I come from? Yeah, where do I get these things, you know, who do I look like, or what kind of medical things am I going to face? I mean, that's all stuff, so even if they don't have an attachment to this biological family that they want to really learn about, they still need to talk through and, and walk through their history, you know. My 25-year-old daughter is adopted, and I came along with the night muscle, and
but I guess the therapist asked her, you know, do you have any support? She goes, oh, well, my stepmom's somewhat there. And this is what she said to me. I'm like, what? Somewhat there? I'm your mom, you know? Like, just rip my hair down, throw it out there in front of a semi, and run it over 15 times. I mean, like, yep. so. It is, it's hard. You have to. That's our baggage. You have to let go. That's our baggage, not well, theirs. Is, is in a book that the men's thing our church is reading right now. They say, I can feel your cup. You have to hold the cup. And there's a the responsibility there on both sides. Now, I can feel your cup. You gotta hold that cup out. It's really hard not to be enough. It is. And you have to just, I guess I have just had to. Yeah, you have to shut it off. Well, well I, oh, you have to stress that little yeah. part off. You, I have you to walk myself are, through it. I have to feel it, too. Just like I'm asking my kids to feel their pain. I have to feel it. I have to vent and, you know, let it all out. And then I have to come back. I have to circle yeah, back and take it, it all. Room, you can't to, No, them. not to them. <laughs> I have to take all of those thoughts captive and hold myself to the truth that I am enough. It just looks different with kids that aren't biologically mine, and that's okay. You have to be okay with that, but it's hard. It's really hard. I like the statement you said, the beautiful ugly. Yes. Um, yes. We have an adopt, uh, we adopted a, well, Danny, those of you that know Danny, um, and he was 10, and he's uh, classic autism. So he does all the flapping, but he's very high verbal, um, and he and so his memories are spontaneous, um, and not always. Am, but I'm his mom because he had he had an adoptive mom and then he had a biological mom. Adoptive mom died, then he came to us. Um, he's he's probably more impactful on any of my fosters, any of my biological children he's more impactful than anybody else that, that and and I could celebrate his gains instead of grieving over the things that he would not be he was never going to be you know captain of the football team or play activities um, he was never going to have be give me grandchildren and I'm okay with that um, but I don't grieve those. Right. I celebrate the things, the gifts right. that he does give. And that's the beauty of not being biologically related to him. Right. Is because I didn't pin my crap on him. <laughs> right. And that's... <laughs> yeah, I, th I think that that's the difference between the two, right? Is us, you know, us gluing the pot back together is us being attached to the expectation that we thought our kid was going to be. But the grog is, no, it all needs, the brokenness to needs to be molded into whoever yeah. that child's going to be. Gosh, that's hard to sit uh, back and it watch. It really is. It's yeah. hard with your own children, your yeah. bio kids, right? Yeah. And, and we adopted, the, we've adopted um, one <laughs> set of siblings. They were a set of six that we only adopted the oldest three because the other three, well, seven, the other had the younger ones had been so we adopted these older kids and in the midst of that one of the kids sexually molested my granddaughter and he's now an adult um, it was just it was horrific it was horrible for us to have to go through and my granddaughter to go through she was three and he was 17 so we're still in the midst of all that crap but that's a hard position to be in too, to still love him, mm -hmm. hate the act, love him, but protect everybody else and protect, man, it's been a, that's the beautiful, ugly crap. That just, <laughs> yeah, and, I mean. And what you said about like, we can try to look like we have it all together, that our kids are all these little perfect things. I think we play that really well in the church world, don't we? Like, Show oh, up man. in your Sunday yeah, best amen. and amen. pretend you're fine. And I think that's one area churches need to, 
I mean, that's a whole other topic for another day. But churches need to have a <clears throat> support system for foster and adoption because once you adopt them, the problems do not go away. Sometimes they get bigger um, and harder. So churches need to be able to really figure out a way to wrap around and provide that safe place for us as parents and also for the kids to feel it's okay to be broken at church. And that's been a hard thing in our world is just getting to that point where it's okay to not look like we have it all together out in public, let people see that this is really, really hard. Um, Because, I mean, there comes a point where you just have to to give up. Like, I can't keep this up. But that's the way it is in every family. Right. And I think that's the piece that we, as foster parents and adoptive parents, can teach our church communities is it's okay. Yeah. It's okay okay that your kid's smoking dope. And you don't agree with it, but it's happening. Right. Stop not talking about it. Right. Talking about it's how you heal. And, and allow the kids to heal. I mean, if the kids feel like they have to put on this perfect face, I'm right. thankful they're in this wonderful family. Because how many people say that? I'm so great that you guys are yeah. healing. You're I'm such a wonderful family. That. <laughs> and that's, you kids I, are so lucky. Oh, you. you're so blessed. Yeah. Like, that's, yeah. Not, that's not what this is. You know? no, and the kids over here are hearing people say that, which then makes them feel like... There's a lot of pressure. Oh, yeah. I have to thankful for this I have to and again then they're not allowed to cry over their birth parents ask questions about it and we hate you all that guts. stuff <laughs> and we have to be okay with that yeah <laughs> we have to be real <laughs> I told my son I said I'm not your friend I'm your father I'm your foster father or your parents Are you guys from Pittsburgh? Gerard. Gerard. Okay. One thing 